Hey, this is Dr. Rob. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. Today we're talking about a fairly esoteric concept, but in the end I hope you're going to see it has some profound implications on the creation and evolution debate. We're talking about effective population sizes. Several months ago I made a mistake. I used some very sloppy language. Even though I knew what I was talking about, I didn't say it correctly, and one of my opponents jumped on me because of it. What I did was I compared the evolutionary within Africa bottleneck, where it is claimed that with an effective size of about 10,000 individuals, Homo erectus evolved into Homo sapiens in Africa several hundreds of thousands of years ago. And I compared that to the census size of modern day cheetahs. And I said, well, there's just under 10,000 cheetahs in the wild, and everyone's worried about them going extinct in the future because there's not enough of them. How come humans didn't go extinct during that bottleneck? Do you see the mistake? I compared an effective size to a census size. An effective size is a theoretical concept. A census size is you can count. Except, if you have a population that's subdivided, then each little subpopulation is going to behave as a smaller population. A large population doesn't necessarily behave as an entire population. It's actually a grouping of subpopulations. That's where the esoteric part comes in. Let me explain. We can do all sorts of computer modeling and statistical correlations and, and draw formulae to explain populations. And the basic idea is that smaller populations have high rates of genetic drift, that is random changes in allele frequency over time. Because if you have a population of say 100 people and 50 of them have blue eyes and 50 of them have brown eyes, it's quite likely that in the future 75 of the people in the future might have blue eyes or 75 of the people in the, in the future might have brown eyes. The genes can shift randomly because it just depends upon how many children the blue-eyed people versus the brown-eyed people have. I know eye color is a lot more complicated than that. It's just a simple illustration to show that in small populations, gene frequencies can shift quickly. Something else we see in small populations is um, things they call identity by descent. So if you have in your genome Say in chromosome one, you have an A in one spot and an A on the corresponding copy, but most other people in the world have a G. Well, the reason you have two A's is because you inherited it from your mother and your father who had the same ancestor. And that, that allele has come to you in two different paths along your family tree, and it's identical by descent. We also see in small populations a lot of what are called runs of homozygosity. These are stretches of DNA where individuals have the same exact sequence on both copies. Because again, the mother and the father had an identical ancestor and that chunk of DNA got passed on through the family tree in two different directions and now we have a strong uh, length of homozygosity with no variation within the individual's genome. This happens frequently in small populations because of inbreeding. So, genetic drift, identity by descent, runs of homozygosity, there are other measurements that statisticians can use to assess how large a population appears. If you take a large population, let's say 10,000 individuals, break it up into isolated groups of let's say 1,000 individuals, each isolated group will behave as a population of only 1,000. And then in the future, if they merge or if they interact and exchange genes again, you're going to look at this big population and say, you know what, this is not behaving like a large population. There's a lot of homozygosity. There's a lot of um, uh, allelic fixation. It looks like a lot of genetic drift has happened. Ah, there must have been subdivision in the past. So you can't compare an effective size to a census size like I attempted to do, and it was a mistake. I admit to it, let's not do that again, okay creationists, we can be better than this. The census population size and effective population size can be the same if you have no barriers to gene flow, you have completely random mating, and if there's no natural selection driving genes one direction or the other. So in a neutralist scenario with completely random mating, the two things are the same. When you have lots of selection or when you're partitioned into subpopulations, that's not true. And yet, here's where the interesting thing comes in. There's a lot of quotations of a specific um, factoid that we see all over the place in science. In fact, let me read you something. This is from Christianity Today. This goes back to the year 2011. They were reviewing Francis Collins' book, The Search for the Historical Atom. And they wrote, Collins' 2006 bestseller, The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief. Stop. You're about to hear a person who claims to be an evangelical Christian give evidence for why he believes the Bible. Sort of. 
What do you think you're going to hear? Adam and Eve or evolution? Watch. He reported scientific indications that anatomically modern humans emerged from primate ancestors perhaps 100,000 years ago, long before the Genesis time frame, and originated with a population of number something like 10,000, not two, individuals. So I'm confused. His evidence for belief is straight up evolutionary theory. That 100,000 years ago, that's an evolutionary out of Africa bottleneck idea. That 10,000 individuals, that's the effective population size that the evolutionists are telling us that modern humans evolved in. And yet, when I started looking into where that number came from, who said it, and why, I ran into a very complex scenario. There are things in genetics that are clear. It is clear that humans expanded away from the Middle East into Eurasia, all the way to Australia, all the way to the Americas, and the farther you go from Middle Eastern setting, the lower the genetic diversity is. They call that a serial founder effect because fewer and fewer people made it to the edges, and then those people's children would move further on, and so we have a dilution of the genes across the landscape that's abundantly clear. But when you get into Africa, where is that population? Where is that population of 10,000? It doesn't actually exist. It's a theoretical thing, and Africa is extremely complicated. I'll have a link to a, a paper in the show notes. If you just skim through that, you'll see how they're invoking, oh, the population at this point was subdivided at this level, but back over here, they merged, and here they migrated, and here, and this, and this, and this, and the other, and the other, and the other. The modeling of that population is incredibly difficult. It's not simple. You can't just say, Here's when it happened, and here's how many people were involved, and here's the level of subdivision. You have to make giant assumptions, and you have to just extrapolate like crazy. So, yes, Africa has more genetic diversity than the rest of the world put together. That's true. Yes, the recombination blocks in Africans are, are smaller than the recombination blocks in the rest of the people in the world. That's either because Africa is an older population or they have more recombination, which I discussed in an earlier episode of Biblical Genetics. We don't necessarily know because these are questions of history, and history requires assumption. We build computer models. These computer models are by necessity oversimplified, and yet we can't go back in time to see what's real and what's just an artifact of our computer programming. And in the end, I still have questions about this effective population size of 10,000 in Africa. We still had a Y chromosome atom arise from a large population with many men. Only one of them is the, the father of all people alive today. In a large population with many women, only one of them is the mother of all the people alive today. And in a subdivided population, that's harder to do than in a well-mixed population. We would have had the fixation of bad alleles. We would have had a genetic drift, the loss of a lot of variation. I'm not sure that this is actually going to work in the end, and I'm thinking that the evolution is going to have to invoke eventually a much smaller effective population size to describe what we're actually seeing. Hey, Christian, you students out there, you want a research project? You want a senior thesis? Here's something you can do. Something we can maybe score some very powerful points for the creation model by just looking in depth at the African story. I don't believe it is what we've been being told for these many years. By the way, Biblical Genetics is supported by some very generous donors, either on patreon.com or buymeacoffee.com. There'll be links in the show notes.